Okay. So here, uh, when we are discussing about uh, sigma, and pi bond so as we to as i told uh, these are formed due to the overlapping of orbitals okay so overlapping of which orbitals you know it is because of s p d f these orbitals because of the overlap of these orbitals we see the formation of sigma and uh, pi bonds okay so if i take s it has only one orbital which is going to be spherical in shape that will be spherical in shape and p we will be having three orbitals px py and pz so these are the three orbitals we have in p which are going to be in dumbbell shape so they are will be in the dumbbell shape so if i take p orbital in p orbital we see that So if I take this as a y-axis, if I take this as a x-axis, and this is going to be my z-axis. Y, x, and z. So we call this axis as internuclear axis. So, in axis, what is it? Now, inter-nuclear axis. We call it as inter-nuclear axis. So, what are these inter-nuclear axis? So, the axis which passes through nucleus of two bonded atoms. That is now inter-nuclear axis. On the very good. Is nothing but axis which passes through nucleus through nucleus of two bonded atoms Okay, so the axis which passes through nucleus of two bonded atoms. So that is nothing but internuclear axis. So if I take uh, two atoms here, let's take so this is the one atom which is A, and this is another atom which is B. And if I draw a axis out there in this way. Okay, so this axis which you see it is known as internuclear axis. So this is the axis which is passing through the nucleus of two atoms, two bonded atoms. So it means A and B are bonded here. Okay, so this shows that A and B are bonded, and this is the axis. So this you can uh, call it as a this is an x-axis. You can call this as an x-axis. Okay, so when we have two bonded uh, atoms. In that, uh, uh, if we see any line passing through nucleus of two bonded atoms, then then we call it as a uh, internuclear axis. Similarly, uh, if I take uh, for p orbital, the p x the p x orbital will be like this. So this is p x. Okay, and you know what is p y? P y will be like this. 
this is py and you know this is pz this is pz okay you got it what i am saying yes sir no okay so got to know what is the axis uh, what is internuclear axis and how the bonds are formed here okay so you can see this is the px orbital here so this is the px and this is the py orbital and the pz and you don't see any other orbitals here only one orbital in the case of s this orbital only one orbital as i told so you will be having only one yes so there is no axis here you cannot take it as a x you can cannot take it as a y or z like that but in the case of p orbital you can take it as a px py and pz we'll be studying about d and f later on so f will not be studying because it's a highly complicated so only we'll be studying about the d okay so now if i take so if you are clear with this uh, i'll move on to the next one so if you have any doubts you can ask me now okay so i think there is no doubt okay i'll move on to the next so now if i take hydrogen so it will be having one mess one electronic configuration it means it has a s orbital here as its orbital and the sphere shape of this is going to be spherical and if you want to sodium which is of a larger size than a hydrogen so you know the electronic configuration of that okay. so this again you can see the outermost shell here for the case outermost shell here in the both case both cases and in the last shell you can see the s orbital is present in the both cases so it means at the valence shell we will be having s orbital only even though we have p orbital here in this case which is completely filled so that will not participate in the bonding as we all know so the 3s orbital which is s orbital and which has a spherical in shape so that is going to participate in the bond and here the size of this is going to be larger than the size of uh, what in the case of hydrogen but uh, once if we see that the valence shell is in or in each orbital so depending upon that uh, the kind of bonding is going to take place whether it is going to be sigma or whether it is going to be pi similarly if i take fluorine so fluorine in the case of fluorine it is going to be so this so now which orbital is this the valence shell is in p orbital in the p orbital so what should be the shape of p orbital what is the shape shape is going to be dumbbell right so dumbbell shape so you can see here 2p5 so you can take it as a dumbbell shape so it will be like in this manner okay similarly if the valence shell comes into the d orbital then it is going to be double dumbbell and in the case of f orbital 
So here, uh, if the overlapping if the overlapping takes place, if the overlapping takes place. Along internuclear axis, and I write it that like that internuclear axis, I n axis, I write like this internuclear axis. Okay, so I have to understand this line if the overlapping takes place along internuclear axis, along, along the internuclear axis, then they are going to form. Sigma bond. Then they will form. Then they will form sigma bond. Okay, so how we can understand this overlapping takes place along internuclear axis, along internuclear axis. So when I am saying along internuclear axis, as I told. In the last example, when I take two, two bonded atoms, so in this case, okay, so the you can observe here, the overlapping is taking place along the axis. See, this is the one orbital, and this is the another orbital. So here, the overlapping is taking place along the axis. Okay, so this is also s orbital, and this is also s orbital. Okay, so when this kind of overlapping takes place, yes and s overlapping takes place, it will form sigma. Are you able to understand what this thing? Similarly. Yes, sir. Okay, similarly, it can also be in this manner. You can take one s plus. One p. If we take like this, okay. If we take like this, and if you observe the overlapping is taking place in this manner, can I call this as a sigma bond? Can I call this overlapping as a sigma bond? No, sir. No, no. Okay. So why why I cannot say this as a uh, sigma bond? Why I cannot call this as a sigma bond? The word is, is can you observe? Uh, is that overlapping is taking place along the axis and overlapping along the axis active yeah hmm anyone along the axis overlapping active yeah you want again no sir So, is there anyone who was there to tell that the overlapping is happening in the along the internuclear axis? Anta yara the head kira. So the uh, overlapping is taking place along the internuclear axis, sir. Here, anta. Anyone? Is there anyone who says that as a correct? Okay, so no one wants to comment on that. Right. So we can see here, right? So the bonding, what is happening here? You can observe it is happening along the axis only, right? So it is passing through the nucleus of two bonded atoms. 
this is the p orbital and this is the s orbital so the internuclear axis is passing through the nucleus of an uh, atom a and the nucleus of an atom b okay where uh, the p orbital and s orbital are participating in the bonding here so s and p are overlapping here but you can see that here the overlapping is along the axis only the overlapping is not uh, i mean so here the overlapping is taking place along the axis so even i can call this as a sigma bonding one okay so in the same manner if i take this is a p orbital and this is another p atom of p orbital this is the one atom the p orbital is in another atom the p orbital so here you can observe the overlap It's taking place like this okay so now can i tell this as a sigma bond no sir no no ah why why i cannot call this as a sigma bond it cannot consist an internuclear axis ah here the internuclear axis is not passing along the axis i mean uh, it, the internuclear axis which is there which is not passing through the orbitals right so that is not in the case of this you can see in the s orbital case here you can see that you can make you can make out the differences here i think okay hmm? so here you can see the overlapping is taking place at this position right at these two position the overlapping is taking place here the overlapping is taking place and here the overlapping is taking place. can you make out the difference here is said now okay so here you can observe that the nucleus is internuclear axis is there but the overlapping is not along the axis right you we have the internuclear axis this is the internuclear axis but we, we cannot see the overlapping here the overlapping is not on the axis it is not along the axis so then what kind of bond i can say tell this one as pi band yes so such kind of overlapping i can call it as pi bond okay so which means uh, what i can tell here uh, the overlapping is perpendicular to the internuclear can i tell that if you observe the overlapping here is going to be perpendicular right to the internuclear axis yes sir you can see observe that If we, if I take this as a internuclear axis, this as a internuclear axis, this is perpendicular to that, right? So such kind of bonds we are going to call it as what? Pi bond. Okay. So I, I hope that uh, people got the difference between sigma and pi bond. Is, are you people clear with this? If you have. any doubts you can just let me know the doubts no what is this axis called as in the case of in the case of pi bond ha huh? yes sir so in the case of pi bond Uh, if you want to see the internuclear axis see here there is no axis on at this two point okay so are uh, we call it this as a just as a perpendicular to the internuclear axis so only one uh, this one is the internuclear axis only this is the internuclear axis okay which is passing through the nucleus of two bonded atoms to that internuclear axis these two which are orbitals which are overlap they are perpendicular so there is no axis for this i mean there is no name for this 
So which is the overlapping is perpendicular to internuclear axis. That's what we are going to test. Okay. So I hope uh, is a thing. Everything is clear to you. Okay. So the more of this and uh, how this orbital overlappings, all these kind of things are many other uh, stuffs to are there to study. Uh, the topics are there to study, so that will study in your uh, few classes. So, but these are the basics what we need for the few classes. Okay. So you need to remember this until I come to this chapter. So don't forget these things. They're very important. Well. So that is about uh, covalent bonding. How this covalent bonding uh, overlaps takes place. And how covalent bond forms the uh, sigma and pi bond, so all that uh, things. So next two uh, will move on to the hydrogen bonding. So before I move on to that, I have a small video to share. The interactions of two or more atoms mainly occur at the outermost shell or energy level. The consequence of these interactions results in a chemical reaction. In atoms that have fewer or more than eight electrons in their outermost energy level, reactions occur that result in the loss, gain, or sharing of electrons with another atom to satisfy the octet rule. The octet rule means that elements tend to combine so that each atom has eight electrons in its outermost shell. This results in the formation of structures such as crystals or molecules. There are two main types of chemical bonds, ionic bonds and covalent bonds. Ionic bonds are bonds where the transfer of electrons takes place. Let's see how this type of bond works. Here we have a sodium atom, which has an atomic number of 11, meaning it has 11 protons in its nucleus and 11 electrons in its shells or energy levels. Shell 1 has two electrons, Shell 2 has 8 electrons, and shell 3 has 1 electron. And here we have a chlorine atom, which has an atomic number of 17. So, 17 protons and 17 electrons. It has 2 electrons in shell 1, 8 in shell 2, and 7 in shell 3. We know that atoms want to have 8 electrons in their outer shell. So, sodium can give up 1 electron, and now it has 8 electrons in its outer shell, and chlorine can take that electron from sodium and that will give it eight electrons in its outer shell. Since the sodium atom gave up an electron, it has 11 protons, which are positively charged, and 10 electrons, which are negatively charged. This results in the formation of a sodium ion with a positive charge. An ion is an atom or molecule with a net electrical charge due to the loss or gain of an electron. Since the chlorine atom gained an electron and now has 17 protons and 18 electrons, it is a chloride ion with a negative charge. The positively charged sodium ion is now attracted to the negatively charged chloride ion and NaCl or table salt is formed. This is an ionic bond. So ionic bonding is when an electron transfer takes place and generates two oppositely charged ions. Now for covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are chemical bonds that are formed by the sharing of one or more pairs of electrons by the outer energy levels or shells of two atoms. The four major elements of the body, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, almost always form covalent bonds by sharing electrons. 
So, for instance, two hydrogen atoms can bond by sharing a pair of electrons. Hydrogen is one of the exceptions to the octet rule of having eight electrons in the outer shell because it only has one shell. Let's look at carbon dioxide, or CO2, which forms a covalent bond. Oxygen has an atomic mass of eight, so eight protons and eight electrons, two electrons in its inner shell and six in its outer shell. So oxygen atoms want two more electrons for their outer shell. Carbon has an atomic mass of six, six protons and six electrons, two in the inner shell and four in the outer shell. So it wants four more electrons for its outer shell. These fellows can make each other happy by sharing what they have. Oxygen atom number one can share two of its electrons with the carbon atom, and in return the carbon atom can share two of its own electrons with oxygen atom number one, making oxygen atom number one happy. Then oxygen atom number two can come in, and like oxygen atom number one, it can share two of its electrons with the carbon atom, and again in return the carbon atom has two more of its own electrons that it can share with oxygen atom number two. So now all three atoms are happy. By sharing two pairs of electrons in this situation, a double bond has been formed. And double bonds are important in chemical reactions. And that be the basics on attractions between atoms. Metals are used in many everyday objects. This morning, when I woke up, I decided to have a soft-boiled egg and a cup of coffee. The pot I used is made of metal. The kettle is made of plastic, but the coiled heating element inside it is made of metal. Metals are good conductors of heat. This is the reason why metals are used to make these everyday objects. You would never see a pot made of wood or a heating element made of plastic. Metals are also good conductors of electricity. The wire connecting your kettle to the electrical socket is actually made of many copper wires, insulated with a layer of rubber. Think about the shapes of the everyday objects we described. The pot, the heating element inside the kettle, and the copper wires. Notice that they are very different. Metals are malleable. This means that they can be molded into different shapes. Metals are very ductile. This means that they can be stretched into wires. To fully understand these properties of metals, we must understand metallic bonding. When we talk about metallic bonding, we are actually describing the electrostatic attraction between the metal ions arranged in a lattice structure and the free-floating electrons around them. Since these electrons are free to move around, the term sea of electrons is also used. What is a lattice structure? And where have you heard this term before? Let's pause the lesson to think about this and resume when you are done. The term lattice structure means that there is a regular repeating pattern. We have heard this term before when discussing ionic lattices. It is used to describe the alternating positions of the metal and nonmetal ions. In metallic structures, however, there are only metal ions. These metal ions are arranged side by side in a regular repeating pattern. The free floating electrons act like a glue and hold the structure in place. This is a very strong attraction and explains why metals have high melting and boiling points. A lot of heat energy is needed to overcome this attraction. This is also why metals are very good conductors of heat. Free floating electrons are the reason why metals can conduct electricity. Metals are malleable and ductile because no matter what shape the metal takes, the free floating electrons will conform to that shape. The strong electrostatic attraction will remain and therefore the structure stays intact. Let's think about it. Cars and bicycles, trains, planes, buildings, cutlery, spectacles, furniture, and endless items can be made from metals. To recap, 
the electrostatic attraction between metal ions arranged in a lattice structure and free-floating electrons is known as metallic bonding. This explains many properties of metals. They are good conductors of heat and electricity, have high melting and boiling points, and are malleable and ductile.